The Secrets of Doctor Who is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Doctor Who, where we discuss everything about the hit BBC series, Doctor Who. And today we're discussing the 12th Doctor story, Listen. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hey, Jimmy. I always confuse this with hush <laughs> or <laughs> hide. <laughs> yes. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going, Dom? Very well, thanks. Uh, before we get to our episode, I want to tell you that you can get your very own Secrets of Doctor Who t-shirt. That includes the TARDIS, Jimmy, Father Corey, and me, uh, or a phone case, or very a lot of other uh, 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 merchandise, by visiting sqpn.com slash merch. Uh, you want to stick around to the end of the episode? We do have a little bit of listener feedback we want to share with you. This is a fun one. And I'll tell you about another show on the network you're sure to enjoy called PlayStation Portable. Pray the Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office of the Church, uh, every day, uh, five opportunities a day. Mm -hmm. You can find that at sqpn.com slash PSP or wherever fine podcasts are found. All right, we're talking about this 12th Doctor, Peter Capaldi, story called Listen. Uh, Jimmy, can you give us a recap of this episode? The Twelfth Doctor becomes obsessed with the idea that there may be creatures that have evolved to be supremely perfect at hiding. And this may explain the feelings people have that they're not alone when they are alone, or the, that there's something hiding under the bed, or that someone is making the noises we hear in the night. Clara is trying to have a date with Danny Pink, but it goes bad, and the Doctor drags her through space and time on a quest for one of the super hiders. They first accidentally go to when Danny Pink was a little boy in an orphanage, and they encounter something hiding under his bed covers, and it may or may not be one of the Doctor's super hiders. Later, Clara goes back to her date with the adult Danny Pink, but it goes wrong again. The Doctor then introduces Clara to Colonel Orson Pink, a time traveler from a century in the future who looks just like Danny, and it's heavily implied Clara may be his great-grandmother. They then go to the last planet at the end of time where Colonel Pink had been stranded, and the Doctor again encounters something that may or may not have been a superhider. There's a crisis, and the superhiders may or may not be assaulting the TARDIS while the Doctor is unconscious, so Clara uses the TARDIS's telepathic circuits to make an emergency escape. They end up on Gallifrey when the Doctor was a boy, and it turns out that Clara was the thing hiding under his bed. But she assures him that this is just a dream, and she comforts him with the idea that it's okay to be afraid, and that fear is a superpower that will let him do amazing things. We end on an inconclusive and bittersweet note, not knowing for sure if the superhiders were real, but the fear that the group has experienced helps Clara make progress in her relationship with Danny Pink, and it has helped the Doctor become a hero. The end. So... This is a kind of kind of a weird one. I, mm -hmm. I, I really of, like this. I, 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 I like it. This, yeah. This is this is probably the best liked of the early Capaldi episodes for me. Mm -hmm. I what agree. Do? I agree. There's a lot. There's a lot going on. A lot of different threads, and I like it. And it it just it kind of one of the things Moffat I think does well is take something perfectly ordinary mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. pull the weird element out of it. Whether yeah. it's uh, angel statues in the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Or just the idea of talking to yourself and why do we talk to ourselves and our fears, our ir irrational fears of things. Well, and it's the things who go bump in the night. It's that feeling when you, you know, they use the example of, you know, you wake up from a dream and you feel someone grab you. Um, you know, for me, it's the, you leave, you turn off the light in a room and you kind of have that feeling like, I got to get out of here. There's something in here. Yes. You know, same kind of thing, though. Mm -hmm. Like, there's something there and we have got to get away from it where there's light. Right. Look, look at the common uh, elements in the monsters that Moffat creates. We have the weeping angels, mm -hmm. which are perfectly ordinary statues that become dangerous. We have the Vashti Narada, which are shadows that, becomes, that become dangerous. We have the silence mm -hmm. that are all around us, and we can't mm -hmm. even remember them. And then we have the listen creature 
or creatures in this episode, and they're all things that are around us like all the time. I mean, the weeping angels are around us whenever there are statues, potentially. Vashtanarada can be in any shadow. The silence can be there and we won't remember them. And the listen creatures can be all around us. And so there's this recurring theme of creatures that can be all around us that, that may be dangerous, but maybe not. So be on your toes. That's the, I think that's the key is th- these are all things that are, that are potentially right out of our vision, right mm-hmm. out of our field of vision, right? That, that they, when you're looking right at them, they're perfectly, well, except for the silence, not perfectly innocuous, but, but when you mm-hmm. look away, they could do things that we don't notice. Although I'm kind of thinking, what if the silence and the super hiders were in the same room? <laughs> would, would the weeping angels think, move? <laughs> I don't think the silence notices them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, there, if there's a super hider in the same room as a weeping angel, is it quantum locked? I mean, these are, these are important questions. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so. But you guys are right. He also is in on exploiting common fears. And in this episode, we have fear of darkness, th- fear mm-hmm. of the thing under the bed, and the fear of noises in the pipes. And I know I had, you know, things like that when I was a kid. Back when I was a kid, there were these, um, I don't know if it was Aurora that made them, but there were these models of, of universal horror movie monsters mm-hmm. like Frankenstein and the Wolfman and Dracula. Mm-hmm. And they had these, part of them were, were regular plastic and part of them were made of glow-in-the-dark plastic. And so Frankenstein's hands would, like, glow in the dark. You know, his clothing would not, but, like, his face and his Mm. hands would glow in the dark. (laughs) And I just knew if I got out of the bed at the wrong time, this glowing giant Frankenstein hand would come out of the bed and grab my leg. Mm. I also had a slea stack in my closet (laughs) at at night, only at night. (laughs) Only at night. I, uh, I had, we had a hallway when I was a kid that went down and turned to the right. And I always, had, as a kid, had this super fear of that corner, like the darkness around that corner. Just, it would always freak me out. I went through there as fast as I could. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, he does talk about like this, everyone has this nightmare where you wake up and somebody, and you put your foot down and something grabs your ankle. I don't, I've never had that. I, is that, is that some? I did. Of, yeah. No, no, no. Glowing Frankenstein hand. Yes, yeah. yeah. Like I said, I never had that one. I always had the, uh, there's something, you know, you turn off the light and something's in there. Yeah. You know, same, same I mean, kind of idea though. There's something hiding yeah. and, you know, and you got just, I have to get out of here. That, that fear. I did have fear of like something under the bed. I did have that. And the, the whole, uh, if you pull the covers up over your head, nothing can get you. You know, that the protection, the iron no, clad protection of the covers. Didn't have that. Then I would start suffocating and have to poke a hole. You were fortunate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the very first ep- uh, word of this episode is the title. The doctor just, he's uh, sitting on top of the TARDIS as it floats over the earth and just says, listen. And then he has this sort of mon- manic monologue thing where he, he goes on and on. And then we get the, uh, the word written on a blackboard. Before we go there, I wanted to mention one other normal fear that is, has a common explanation. Like in this, they talk about it can be water bubbles in the pipe or it can be metal expanding as you know what's mm-hmm. responsible for all these noises. But one of the things the doctor runs past is th- seeing things out of the corner of your eye. Mm-hmm. And those actually can be produced by sound. Mm. Uh, people, there are, there are cases of this where I know one case of a haunting that turned out to not be ghosts. It was all just weird, normal stuff. But um, the house was under high tension lines and they, the high tension lines would generate this hum mm-hmm. and a hum of 18 hertz or 18 cycles per second is approximately the resonant frequency of the eye. And it will cause you to see things out of the corner. It can cause you to see things out of the corner of your eye. And so um, that's another explanation that they mentioned the phenomenon of seeing things out of the corner of your eye. And maybe it's Maybe it's something, and maybe it's not. And and mm-hmm. 18, 18 hertz um, sound is something that can cause that phenomenon naturally. Right. So the the doctor poses this question: if if evolution were to perfect the, the perfect survival skill is perfect hiding, mm-hmm. and so if there was a creature out there that had perfect hiding, how would we ever know? And that's a that's a kind of an interesting question. That's I, I, mm-hmm. I kind of like that that uh question um although he makes an assumption that such a creature would necessarily be intelligent 
Well, I mean, and, right, which is not true at all. And right. also that it would be perfect because he says, you know, there's perfect predators and perfect prey, but of course, neither is true. That's, neither is true, right? You there know, are no and perfect so predators uh, or prey. Yeah. So a perfect hiding creature wouldn't actually exist. It would be a, a almost perfect hider, which means we would know it exists. Right. Well, potentially. I mean, potentially. evolution is messy. Is messy, and sometimes you, sometimes you evolve in a way that lets you know the thing you're afraid of is there, and sometimes you don't evolve that way. Right. Um, I do really like the opening shot of the doctor of the TARDIS in space with the doctor oh, yeah. sitting. He's not in the lotus position because lotus position, um, <laughs> but but he is sitting cross-legged. Uh, yeah. cross-legged on the top of the TARDIS, just meditating in space, and that's a really cool opening shot. Mm-hmm. And then he then he begins his his weird self lecture, which is meta because he's talking about why do people talk to themselves when they know they're alone, and the mm-hmm. answer is maybe they're not alone, and that gets him off on this thing about perfect hiders and how would we know and maybe this could explain why you're sure someone is watching you but you turn around and they're not there and this is actually something that there has been research done on i mean it's it, it's in the it's parapsychological research rather than mainstream research but uh rupert sheldrake has done a whole bunch of research on the sense of being stared at where you can, they, they randomly stare or don't stare at you, and your job is to tell at the moment whether you're being stared at or not. And it's above chance. People, people have a sense, apparently, of, yeah, someone's looking at me right now. I'm being observed right now. And, and that hooks directly into our, uh, our premise for this episode, which is very high concept. Mm. You know, even though the even though he's got a lot of stuff about relationship in here with Clara and Danny, mm-hmm. the fundamental premise, the A plot of this story is really, really high concept with this super hider premise. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also found the doctor's annoyingness mm-hmm. um, less annoying this episode. I mean, mm-hmm. he's, it's still there. They're still writing him to be deliberately annoying, but I found it less Fingers on fingernails on the blackboard, annoying mm-hmm. than I do for much of early Capaldi. It it comes off th- in this one a little bit more like just sometimes clueless, sometimes not really all that clueless, uh, which is interesting. I mean, mm-hmm. it, so I, I like it. This is a Moffat. Uh, he wrote this one. Uh, yep. Yes, uh, so that clear. So uh, uh, Clara has this awkward first date with Danny Pink. Which goes badly several times, <laughs> and uh, uh, for both of because of both, both of them, them. both yeah. of them make mistakes. It, both of them make clueless mistakes. It's like, why would you ever say that on a date? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes, she, I mean, she talks about like her. Sometimes her mouth has a mind of its own and goes off on it, goes off, and uh, <laughs> and he's extra sensitive about the soldier thing. Like she says, he's hypersensitive about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. She says something about. Um, uh, you it was about know, being like, killed. Yeah, that, you know, oh, I could kill killings. that girl sometimes. One of the students. Yep. And and you know, from you that means something. And he says, "Sorry." And it's like maybe she meant from you. You're such a mild person for you to be angry at one of the students like that much. Would is, I mean, it's just yeah. But regardless of that, he then yeah. goes gives her this speech that we only hear part of, but it's implied. It's this lengthy speech about all the good he did as a soldier, mm-hmm. including digging twenty three wells. And then a yeah. waiter comes by and asks if they want any more water. And, and Clara's like, we're good. He'll probably dig for it. And it's like, <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Ow. Leave some water for that burn he just got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and then she ends up storming out, basically. And, yeah. and they've been interspersing this. The way they shot this is shots of her at home after this, back and forth. So she's sort of remembering this. And then when she gets home, she discovers the doctor there, and he's clueless about her mood, which is he, usual. He, I also like he's he's put the TARDIS in her bedroom, and there's cluelessness here in, a, in several ways. Number one, he's parked it behind the door in such a way she can't fully open the door, and she has to squeeze around her own door to get into her own bedroom because the TARDIS is blocking it. Yeah. And, and secondly, he says, I thought you might come home after the date, so I figured I better hide in your bedroom. <laughs> it's <laughs> right. like, um... Right. Yeah, yeah. People do come home after dates, and sometimes, and 
the that the may doc- not be the best room to hide in. <laughs> no. Yes, the doctor um, being a a a, a, a con- um, conventional morality clueless uh, on that case. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but then he's sitting at her vanity table, and he's like, why do you need three mirrors? Why can't you just turn your head? Yes, this is a question <laughs> every guy has. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, later on, it's, it's a, because she has such a wide face. So he right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, the actress, Jenna Coleman, does have a remarkably wide face. She does have kind of a cute, round face. Yes, yeah. it's very um, mm-hmm. chibi-like. Um. So he he hijacks her for his experiment. He wants to take her to some place in her past where she's had this dream of waking up and getting her ankle grabbed, and kind of hooks her into the telepathic circuits of the TARDIS. So that it's, and they look weirdly gooey. organic. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Um, and I like how when she puts her after she's got her hands in him, he says, "If anything bites, let it." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not sure whether he's joking or not. No, and, I don't uh, think he is. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, he turns off the safeguards, which is always a bad idea, and so that she can p- pilot it. And she gets distracted. Like Danny calls yep. on her cell phone, and she thinks once, of him. Once so- again, once again, we've got the super cell phone that can reach through space and time because that's a thing in Doctor Who. Right. Well, and that's that's. You know that's fine. They they, well, they haven't taken off yet, have they? At that point, uh, they think they have. Oh, okay. but I it, either way, I mean, I don't think they need to resolve it for us. Yeah, um, because they've established that Rose had a super phone back yeah. in season in the first season of the Revive Two. Sure, but um, she initially resisted coming with the Doctor because she was kind of hoping that Danny Pink would call her. So when her phone goes off, she assumes it's Danny Pink calling her. And the doctor's like, ignore it, ignore it, ignore it. And she's trying to ignore it. And they end up in a place she's, she's never been to before outside of, an, uh, outside of an orphanage. And she says, but I've never lived in an orphanage. And I love the doctor's line. This is more of where Moffat is really good at dialogue. We have a bunch mm-hmm. of nice dialogue in this. He says, You've probably just forgotten. Have you seen the size of human brains? They're hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that was a good line. That was funny. Um, it's bad if I meet myself. It's potentially catastrophic. So yeah. why did you bring me here? <laughs> so he goes, I also, like the next line. So she sees a little boy standing in a window uh, named Rupert, uh, Rupert Pink. Who hates his name. Right. So and, she's, and plans to change it. Right. And she's not at this point not quite sure this is Danny. I mean, since it's Rupert, not not Danny. Anyway, the doctor goes in and ends up seeing the the a night caretaker. watchman caretaker, um, and kind of asks him like like, uh, do you work here all, every night? Do you ever end up talking to yourself? Um, what about your coffee? Sometimes do you put it down, look around, and it's not here. Uh, and then his TV in the other room turns off. He's like, who turned your television off? It just it does that. It just goes off He as he turns to look and looks back. The doctor's vanished. And then his mug is gone. It must have been taken by one of the super hiders. And then we no. cut to the doctor standing in the hallway drinking his coffee. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. That was, the doctor stole his coffee. That also, was awesome. like at the beginning of the scene when the doctor shows up and he's clearly just sonic his way through, you know, the outer door. Yeah. Um, but the, the caretaker says, how did you get in? And the doctor says, your daughter must be faulty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's it. Must be faulty. And, and then and he he's... shows him the psychic paper and the guy interprets it as an inspection at 2 AM. And the doctor's like, what better time? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. It's not expected. Nobody expects the midnight inspection. Uh, so Clara, meanwhile, has come in to talk to the, the little boy who is, had been talking to her from the window. And, and this is something, you know, partly I guess it's because I'm not a TV character, and partly <laughs> I guess it's because this is a different time, and partly than it would have been in the past, you know, when, like when they're visiting, and partly it's because I'm a male. But she's just wandering in. This strange woman is coming into a kid's room at 2 a.m. with no, with no chaperone. Mm. Yeah. And I'm like, do you realize how much legal jeopardy you're putting yourself in by this? I mean, what is this? What is this cute? What is this? What is this female privilege going on here? 
<laughs> right. There's a little bit of female privilege involved in this. Also, time traveler privilege, because what are they going to do? Arrest her? She'll just, the doctor will take her away. Uh, but in any case, uh, they have this discussion about why he's awake and why he's scared. Uh, he woke up and... Uh, and they, she she is very comforting to him to help yes. talk him through his fears. Right. And in fact, uh, you know, she looks under the bed. See, there's nothing. That, you know, Do you know what's under here? And then she says, me. And then she climbs underneath. And then she, you know, convinces him to come in. And it's like, no, see, nobody here except us. It's, it's and, fine. And that's really, that's really great. I mean, that's a really yeah. great strategy to help him get over his fear. You know, just get under the yeah. bed. Yes. And then something sits on it from above. <laughs> yep. That is so awesome. That's so <laughs> creepy. And that's and then it's like who's in the room? Nobody. Somebody must have come in. Nobody came in. <laughs> and then they come out. And then there's somebody sitting on the bed under the bedspread. And that is yeah. so creepy. It is I awesome. To, I have to tell you a story. Mm -hmm. When my sister was my older sister was young, she used to uh, uh, tuck in the her sheets very tightly when she went to bed so that she wouldn't have to make her bed in the morning. That's, which is a very brilliant idea, I think. Except one time. She, she had tucked it in so tight and she had slipped underneath the covers that when she woke up, she didn't know which way was out. So she tried one way. That didn't mm. work. Tried another way. That didn't work. Tried the third way. That didn't work. She's like, oh, this must be the way. Tried the fourth way. And that didn't work either. And ended up screaming bloody murder. murder so my mom would come in the middle of the night and let her out of her bed. Mm. So that's, oh, that's, yeah. Every time I see this, I think of that story of my sister underneath the, uh, the lump in the bed. Yeah. <laughs> And and it's just sitting there yes. with its with its head up, and and if, at first it looks kind of small, but then it sits up further, and it's like the size of a full size person sitting under the bed sheet, and you can't see any of the person. Right, and they don't make a noise. There's not and, a yeah, sound. they don't don't make a noise. They don't talk. And I have in my notes genuinely at this point genuinely low key creepy atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I thought this yeah. was very very effectively done. That was very creepy. And then uh, they turn around and the doctor's there reading a book and he's going, he's complaining that he can't find Wally in it, which is what in Britain, in Britain where's they have Wally? Where's Wally. Here in America we have Where's Waldo. Yep. Yeah. Um, but he's, he can't find Wally in the book and it's not a Wally book. Hmm. And, <laughs> and, and Rupert points this out to him and he says, well, how do you know if you haven't found him? And, right. and Which is the theme and, of the, the story of the, of the exactly. episode. Yeah. yeah. And, and Rupert says, Wally is not in every book. And the doctor says, well, there's a few years of my life I'll be needing back. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I've been looking in every book. And then he talks about being scared and how, again, how fear is a superpower. Uh, and he ends up giving this speech about fear, which we will find out at the end, is the same speech that Clara gives this, the young doctor in right. the barn. So we have a bootstrap paradox with this yeah. speech. Mm -hmm. Right. Clara gave right. it to, the doctor gave it to Clara in the future and the doctor gave it to Clara in the past. Right, right. What, what's extra scary for me about the fear is a superpower thing? That was Charles Manson's philosophy. <laughs> um, he, would, he would, I mean, I've done loads of reading about the Manson family and the Tate LaBianca murders and Charles Man. one of his key thoughts was that you need to be as afraid as possible so you can be as alive as possible. And um, yeah. this fear is a superpower thing just doesn't come across quite so comforting to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking Charles Manson. I mean, it's really adrenaline is a su superpower, right? Yeah. You know, adrenaline gets your heart pumping, makes your senses, you know, go and gets your eye eyes dilated, all that sort of stuff. Um, and Fear is what gets your adrenaline going. So I yeah. get that. The doctor gets them all to turn their backs, including, including Rupert, who doesn't want to. But he gets them to all turn their backs, and then the doctor says to the thing under the covers, go in peace. If all you want is to stay hidden, we won't look. Just go. And he makes them all promise not to look, even including Rupert, who is tempted to turn right. around. But we see in the reverse angle shot the thing Something. under the covers behind them and it takes off the bedspread, which is orange, and we see something like a person underneath it, but it's out of focus. So we don't know exactly what it is. But there was something there. It was either a yeah. human playing a trick or something. But or, something misshapen. Yeah. It. Well, I don't know if they put prosthetics on it to make it misshapen, but yeah. I mean, it was definitely out of focus. But 
it it does definitely hint at these super hiders. Yeah. So something was there, but is it the super hiders that the doctor was positing? Uh, yeah. But we never see. We'll never see. Also, uh, it's it's very effective, I think, in the horror where the doctor is contemplating about what would happen if you turn around a thing that that must never be seen. What would it do? And um, like Rupert says, I don't know. And the doctor says, neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. You, you, that's not very comforting. So Clara ends things with, with uh, little Rupert by giving, you know, putting his toy soldiers around the bed and telling him that the toy soldiers will guard him and gives him the boss soldier, Dan the soldier man that he calls him. And this is all another bootstrap paradox. Where, where is it bootstrap? But it's a, another it, paradox it's not, where Clara not, gives him his name. It's yeah, it's sort of a it's it's not a classic bootstrap, but it's it's a bootstrap with a leader into the boot into the paradox because he's already apparently named that soldier Dan the soldier man. It's a soldier yeah. with no gun, and Clara tells him that this soldier is the boss because he's so brave he doesn't need a gun. And um, and so it's clear that this is playing into Danny's self identity as a soldier, and we're going to find out later. The doc, well, in a, in a minute, we're going to find out the doctor gave him a dream of being uh, that he was Dan the Soldier Man, and so right. between the doctor's actions and the fact he'd already named this soldier that, and that he is now a a soldier without a gun, yeah, all of that. But he's he's br- nevertheless brave. Um, all of those things combine into, into Rupert picking the name Danny in the future. Yes. Yeah. But there's also a great bit of dialogue right before this happens where Clara is trying to be reassuring to Danny and as they're about to leave. And the doctor is, keeps undermining her by saying, actually, no, we're not safe. You know, things like that. Mm-hmm. And she keeps trying to dismiss what the doctor is saying to reassure Danny so that he won't be terrified as they're about to leave him. And the doctor says, people don't need to be lied to. <laughs> and Clara says, people don't need to be scared by a big gray stick insect either, but here you are. <laughs> 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 yes. And before they go, Danny asks, who is starting to be reassured, asks, can you tell me a story? And Clara starts to, and then the doctor just says, once upon a time, and he touches him on the forehead, the end. <laughs> yes. And Danny is instantly asleep. Yeah. And and the doctor turns to Clara and says, "Dad skills," and, right. it's, and so I could just imagine him with his own children back on Gallifrey doing that to get him to instantly go to sleep. He <laughs> yes. probably did it with his grandchildren too. I can see him doing that to Susan. Just <laughs> yeah. once upon a time, the end. <laughs> and they're already asleep. <laughs> oh man, if I could do that now, that's a superpower. <laughs> that's what I want. <laughs> so. uh she gets the doctor to take him back to her. take her back to Danny in the restaurant at the moment where she walked out. So, you know, it, she says it's kind of violates, probably violates some uh, time Lord law. But, you know, can you do this for me? And uh, so, she, so she goes back. She wants to mend things. But she ends up putting her foot back in her mouth <laughs> by revealing that she knows his real name is Rupert. And how how mm-hmm. could she possibly know that? Because I'm sure it, it, it within this, the bounds of the story, it's something he's told no one, that his name is only Danny and he never says Rupert. And yeah, so well, therefore she must have investigated him. He says he's never, he hasn't used that name in years. So how could she have known it? Which means he, you know, obviously got his name legally changed and things like that. So. Right. Yeah. So he, that starts him on the road to being suspicious. First though, there's some great Stephen Moffat banter uh-huh. where they're, they're talking about each other's names. And she's not really happy with Oswald, but he likes it. And he's not happy with Pink, but she likes it. And she says, I like Pink. And he says, well, then you can have it. And, and she says, bold offer, Mr. Pink. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, interpreting his, his just dismissive, oh, well, then you can have this name if you like it so much, as a, as a marriage proposal. Right. And, um, and which was more than he intended. And so we have, and this nice, cute, awkward banter that, you know, with the romantic Mm -hmm. subtext, I like that. But then she does, she calls him, she focuses on the name Rupert and gah, okay, that makes him suspicious. And then he gets even more suspicious because he noted that when she stormed out, she took her coat with her 
And now she doesn't have a coat. And she, he says, where's your coat? Mm. And he yes. suspected something much more is going on here. And as this is happening, a, giant, a man in a giant orange spacesuit <laughs> walks into the restaurant and looks at Clara and is gesturing with his hand, come on, gesturing back to the TARDIS. Yeah. Right. And she's trying to have this romantic dinner. And, of course, she assumes it's the doctor being his usual clueless self. And right. so Danny this time is so mad at Clara that he gets up and storms out. And so Clara reluctantly follows the man in the spacesuit, and she starts chewing him out. And she's like, can, at how clueless he is, interrupting this date, this normal human thing she's trying to do. And she says, is there anything you could possibly do that would make this more surreal at this moment? And the man in the spacesuit takes off his helmet, and it's Orson Pink. It's, right. He looks exactly like an older mm -hmm. version of Danny. Yes. And so, like, yeah, he could do something that would make this more surreal. And then the doctor comes, comes in from stage left and explains who Orson is and so forth. And he's right. somehow, somehow connected to Clara's timeline because the TARDIS took him there. And the doctor's clueless about Danny. Like, he doesn't realize that Orson and Danny are in any way connected or that Danny has anything to do with Rupert or Orson. And he's just kind of being clueless about this. And, but, and he says, for some reason, he's, he's, you know, in your timeline from about 100 years in your future. And Clara is starting to get this clue. And now this, this creates the problem, the paradox that a lot of fans have brought up, which is if Danny dies later in the season as a Cyberman. Yeah. yeah and Clara also dies and comes back and lives in between heartbeats. How could this possibly be a descendant of either of them? And that's, that's a paradox that gets introduced here that Moffat apparently doesn't care about. <laughs> well, no, he, he, he has a solution for it. Um, so they, during 2020, during, part of, during Doctor Who lockdown, which was an online event where people connected with Doctor Who were doing stuff, uh -huh. uh, they were apparently uh, doing a tweet along of this story. So people were watching the story at the same time, and they were tweeting about it. And someone... A uh, fan said, we're not going to mention the paradox of Orson Pink. We're just going to ignore it. At which point, uh, Stephen Moffat tweeted, there is no paradox. Danny's father had an estranged brother who also had a family. Um. And that would solve the paradox. If, if Danny's father had a brother uh, within 100 years, you know, you could still have... So he's a grand grandchildren cousin. that would... Yeah, yeah, so this was essentially a... a, a I, I haven't done the charting for figuring out exactly the cousinal relationship. But yeah, this is this is an I identical cousins all the way. Be like a second but, cousin uh, th th three times removed or something like some, that. Something. Yeah. How but how is he connected to her future? Like like that's the thing. So, mm. well, one I mean, so P Stephen Moffat had also previously stated that one possible, well, some, he had stated that um, Orson, it was possible that Orson was a lateral descendant of Danny's, which is essentially what we just described. And in some versions of the theory, Clara, after Danny's death, contacted his relatives and hypothetically could have even become in, romantically involved with one of them. And that's something that could happen in Clara's timeline, mm -hmm. you know, in her further adventures in the space diner. Yeah, it, it, living in between heartbeats, which is, essentially mm -hmm. means she's not dead. She's undead. She's <laughs> she's a zombie, zombie Clara, uh, with with me, not me, but you know me. A shielder, me. Shielder. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, this Or Orson talks about his distant relative. Uh, you know, is is a uh, great grandmother, great grandmother, and, just one great. Yes. Uh, you know, probably the doctor says, you know, probably quite old and really fat looking. <laughs> Speaking of Clara. So and then it turns up he has the uh, Dan Dan, the soldier man toy figure, which has become a fairly family heirloom. And uh, and he was a time traveler who had got stuck at the end of time. So some planet at the end of time where everything is dead except for whatever's outside the time capsule, the time ship that Danny was in. Or, I'm sorry, yeah. Orson was in. Barren, red-tinted wasteland. Yep. Yes. And um, I like how 
you know, they explain he was one of the early time shots and they only meant to send him in the, into the middle of next week. And Clara says, what happened? They overshot. Mm. <laughs> and he ends yeah. up at the end of time on the last planet. Right. And as far as this planet goes, Big Finish has an interesting interpretation because later, not this season, but I guess next season, um, Gallifrey is located at the end of time as mm. like the last planet. And so while they're, while they're in the spaceship, the doctor wants, now Orson wants to get out of there. He's like packing, he's ready to go. But the doctor wants to spend the night because he, he's figured if we've eliminated everything else in the universe, maybe the super hiders will manifest themselves again, if, you know, if we stay here. And he's even he makes got an assumption. Yeah. That he, super hiders would be the last creatures. Right. He also um, thinks that they've been manifesting to Danny. And that's why Danny is so anxious to get out of here or part of why. And, um, and he's got these little clues in the spaceship or the time ship that he thinks that um, may indicate that. So he basically wants to do Motel 6 at the end of the universe. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, and da Danny doesn't, or Orson doesn't want to do that. So he goes into the TARDIS where he's told it'll be safe. But Clara mm -hmm. and the doctor stay outside. And indeed, Orson had heard, like, things outside the ship knocking and trying to get in that could be the super hiders or could just be the hull expanding with the temperature change for the night cycle. Mm. And in a, in a big finish story called R and J, it is implied that Orson or sorry, that uh, Jack Harkness and river song were both time travelers were outside the door playing a prank on Orson. <laughs> and, and, and river song also had a note about there being a woman playing chess on the planet at the end of time. And that would match up with a shielder who was on the planet at the end of time playing chess. And mm. that would imply that the planet they're on is Gallifrey. Mm. Uh. And I think that's a fascinating reconstruction or interpretation of this because, um, the next place they go is in, in an emergency getaway is early Gallifrey when the doctor was a boy. So hmm. now if, it, if Gallifrey, is that also where the restaurant at the end of the universe is located? As Douglas <laughs> Adams mentions. Mm -hmm. Around the corner. Yeah, exactly. It's yep. across the street from the Motel 6 at the end of the universe. Yep. The but restaurant patrons need somewhere to stay. Exactly. Remind me when we, when we, we uh, had the master at the end of the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, episode that was a different planet though yeah it was that wasn't as far as this is this is even farther because there was more than one civilization still surviving then at that point okay and the, mm -hmm. but this is the last last um okay um it's interesting so the at this point the doctor is actually kind of kind of manic about this whole thing mm -hmm. the uh oh, yeah. the this uh idea of finding the hiders almost to the point of like self-destructive behavior and it's kind of freaking out clara mm -hmm. like why are you so you know crazy about this whole thing and i i love i love again the dialogue in this at one point early on clara is freaking out because of all the doctors revealing to her about where they are and and the doctor turns to orson and says she's doing the all eyes thing it, <laughs> it's because it's her face is so white she had three mirrors <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. That's the weird thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, so he gets in there. Uh, the he unlocks the door so that whatever's outside could can open it. The door does open, which th th we get you know plausible explanations for why it could just be something. Well, opens. up up to a point, but then at a certain point, with the door is it's not just making no knocking noises like that could be due to heat expansion. There's this circular hatch that is turning. And Clara asks the doctor, are you doing that? And he says, no. So something is turning this circular hatch. We never see what it is because he orders Clara inside the TARDIS. And she says, no, I'm staying with you. And then he says, then you will never travel with me again because that's the deal. You do as you say into the TARDIS now. And so she has to go into the TARDIS. And he stays out there. And there's like explosive decompression that is way too violent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Danny has to go out and rescue him. And when he comes in, the doctor is unconscious because he's been exposed to 
lack of atmosphere for too long. Well, something hit him in the head. Not yeah, okay. he's, got a knot, okay. he's got a knot on his head yeah, as well. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's true. Yeah. But something opened that door, and we don't know what it well, was. He, the doctor says releasing it could have triggered the opening mechanism. Okay. So, I mean... I didn't hear that. Okay. Yeah, there's all these plausible explanations for why everything is ha you know could be happening that is could be something other than a super hider mm -hmm. you know that mm -hmm. it, the only the only thing that we get in this whole episode that you can't explain another way is whatever it was that was standing behind them in rupert's room mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the only well, thing that they, has they, no they, they do explain that in another way though they say it, even after they've encountered it they say it could have been someone one of rupert's friends playing a prank yeah that's true uh, just a weird one. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's a nice build in the drama where yep. they're in the TARDIS and, and before they get in the TARDIS, Clara and the doctor have both been repeating what is apparently a British nursery rhyme mm -hmm. about monsters lurching out and getting you. And I had never heard this nursery rhyme before. So I, I'm guessing this part of it would mean more. I mean, it's an effect. It's a creepy nursery rhyme, but I'm, I'm guessing this it would have added more to this sequence for um, for British listeners than for American listeners. But then once the doctor is unconscious and Clara and Orson are kind of alone being in charge now in the TARDIS, the doors of the TARDIS are under assault by something, maybe, and it's getting louder, and, and Orson turns to Clara and says, you said nothing could get through there, right? And she's not as sure, but she's she she's she's thinking, oh, nothing can you know we're 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 safe. She's she's trying to dismiss it, but the noise is getting louder at the doors, and then we hear a single tone of the cloister bell, which immediately tells longtime fans this is a serious threat. Yeah, right. That's yeah. I mean, they they kind of speculate. Well, maybe the doors are the rest of the air is escaping from the time ship, and that's what makes the doors rattle, but. If the cloister yeah. bell is going, yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's one thing. So she uses the telepathic circuits to get away again, uh, and ends up instead of in in Orson's time, which I think was where she was trying to go. They end up uh, outside this barn, and it turns it, out it's in a barn. This barn, right? This is the barn on Gallifrey where the war doctor mm -hmm. uh, had met with the the moment, the weapon. That looked like Rose Tyler, uh, and th so this barn that means something to and the doctor. And if a weapon is going to look like anyone, it may as well be Rose Tyler. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. And uh, so the 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 uh, Clara goes in, and then these two adults talking about this boy that r insists on sleeping in the barn instead of in the house, and uh, something about him joining the army. Oh, he's not going to join the army. Oh, you don't think he's going to make it to the the Time Lord Academy? And that's when Clara realizes where they are, and who the boy probably is. Uh, and so she, she ends up going up to see the boy, and he starts waking, and so she climbs under the bed, and as he gets out of bed, she, it looks like almost unthinking, grabs yeah. his ankle, yep. and then realizes immediately what she's just done, yeah. and set all of this in yep. motion, uh, which, is, which is cool. I like that. Yeah, I love the irony of Clara was the thing under the doctor's bed, because we'd previously established that he also had had these thing under the bed fears as a child. Right. And this is when she tells him, listen, getting mm -hmm. the title going again, and then tells him all that fear is the superpower stuff that he told her, her late earlier. Uh, so we get that bootstrap paradox. And um, as she gets back to the, she goes back to the TARDIS, she gets him to go get back into bed. She goes back to the TARDIS and she, she wants the doctor to promise not to look out the, the, the door of the TARDIS to find out where they were. And why doesn't she want him to know where they are? Um, I, I can see a number of reasons. First one, you're not supposed to cross your own timeline. You're not supposed to interact with yourself. He had previously said it could be potentially disastrous and she doesn't know how it works. Okay. So she may simply be wanting to avoid a potential disaster. Um, on the other hand, this is a very intimate thing. And she realizes, she even says this part out loud, that the big bad Time Lord doesn't want to admit he's afraid of the dark. Hmm. And this is, but she's, she's just seen right to the core of that situation. And so this was a very intimate 
thing that she became aware of about him and that she played a role in. And it could, if someone, you know, goes to the root of one of your deepest fears and admits they kind of sort of planted it and kind of sort of set you on your life course, Mm -hmm. you could feel a little violated. And so she may be also not wanting him to realize where they were because of, uh, he could perceive it as a kind of intimate, personal, not a sexual violation, but an emotional violation. Yeah. At, at, we we get this flashback of her giving the speech to the boy, and then we, we get a flash of the war doctor standing outside the barn fr- from the day of the doctor. As she says, um, one day you're going to come back to this barn, and on that day you're going to be very afraid indeed, but that's okay because if you're very wise and very strong, fear doesn't have to make you cruel or cowardly. And in that sense, I guess what she's saying is, is you know, she's keep telling him, when you're back here as the war doctor, don't don't do the bad thing. You know, you, you don't yeah. have to be cruel or cowardly. You and can she, do the brave thing. And she has lived through all that and knows about the involvement of the 10th and 11th doctors and mm-hmm. what they do instead so that he doesn't end up destroying Gallifrey. Right. 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 So I wonder, I'm, and maybe she just doesn't want him to see how that all began or something. But yeah, I think your, your, your explanation might be even more plausible, which is that she just doesn't want him to know that she's the one who put this primal fear into him as a child. Um, and anyway, she says, uh, she does say that fear can make you kind and then gives him a hug. And he, and he does the, no, no, not the hugging. I'm against the hugging, <laughs> which, is, which is great. She makes this a Scottish crack earlier too, doesn't she? I forget what it was, but she, she does make a, a crack about him being Scottish uh, earlier. We also see in a kind of montage sequence of her going over to Danny Pink's house. Mm-hmm. Who, and he's now, since he was the one who walked out in the latest version of all this, he's now feeling terrible. And, and she goes over and they reconcile and they end up kissing. And in her narration, talking about fear, it, it, she talks about how it can bring us together and, and how it can make you a superhero in essence. And they're cutting back and forth between her and Danny being brought together and the doctor alone contemplating stuff. And so he's clearly the superhero that she's talking about, and they're clearly the ones being brought together. And you may be going, well, how is Danny being brought together by fear? Because he didn't participate in any of this um, adventure. It was Orson that did. Mm. But no, actually, he, his, own, his and Clara's own insecurities were part of what kept causing their date to go off the rails Mm -hmm. because of, you know, like he's really insecure about having been a soldier and he really has killed someone who wasn't innocent. We don't, haven't been told that yet, but that's part of what's going on in his head. Um, But his own insecurities messed up the date, just like Clara's insecurities messed up the date. And insecurity is just fear. So their own, and then Clara's more intense exposure to fear at the end of time, caused her to go over to his apartment and reconcile. So there are senses in which fear was both driving them apart and bringing them together. Oh, also, the last thing we see, the, the Clara left Dan the soldier man with the young doctor. Uh, by the way, in that scene, uh, she says, um, "You're always to, to the young doctor, you're always going to be afraid, even if you learn to hide it. Fear is like a companion, a constant companion always there, but that's okay because fear can bring us together. That is a quote from the first doctor, what he told to Barbara Mm -hmm. in the Cave of the Skulls in Unearthly Child. So Mm. that's a deep, deep cut (laughs) all the way back to the beginning. Really stretched out bootstrap paradox there. (laughs) Yes, yes. So uh, very, very interesting. And that's where we end the the episode. So, uh, Father Corey, any. Final thoughts on this one? Everything I wanted to say got mentioned, so nope. Okay. Jimmy, how about you? Um, this is one of two Stephen Moffat era stories that were based off, or not era, but two Stephen Moffat stories that were based on a, um, on a written Doctor Who story. Because in, over in England, they have this like annual Doctor Who storybook of it's like a big bigger book it's for children that has can have activities in it and stuff but it's also got stories that are written by 
sometimes people who later went on to write for the show, like Stephen Moffat and Russell T. Davies. And um, one of the stories called What I Did on My Christmas Holidays by Sally Sparrow ended up yep. becoming the story Blink. Mm -hmm. And this is based on a short story called Corner of the Eye, in which it's, the story is quite different, but Stephen Moffat wrote it, and he was exploring the idea of monsters who had a super hiding ability, and these monsters were called floofs. And... Um, and so he had previously explored that concept. Another one that he didn't write, but that did get made in his era, was The Lodger, where the doctor is... It's the one that introduces... Uh, is his name Stephen? James Gordon. Well, James Gordon, but... Co but uh, Gordon. Yeah. Um, I can't remember either, yeah. Yeah, uh, but I mean, it's yeah. a fun episode, which is, which is why after he became showrunner, Stephen Moffat contacted the original audience the author and said, I want to do The Lodger because it's so much fun. But it's the one where the doctor becomes, a, a, like, rents an apartment in a guy's house because something mysterious is going on. And, uh, and the guy is, is kind, of, uh, kind of not assertive and not in charge of his life and is kind of wasting his life. And he's got this girl who is obviously in love with him that he's never, you know, gotten romantically involved with. And the doctor both deals with the creepy thing upstairs and gets the couple together. Craig. Craig, that's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's going to drive me crazy if I didn't figure that out. If that's it, uh, let's move on to our listener feedback. This is a bit of a little fun question. Uh, it doesn't have to relate to any particular uh, discussion we've had, but Stephen Haddock uh, asked on our Discord community, if you were going to make your own Doctor Who story, which Doctor, and by extension companions, would you use, and what would the premise of the story be? And I know I'm kind of springing this on you guys, uh, but uh, what yes, would you, you say? Yes, you are. I, hmm. I know. Uh, so do the best, best you can. At least talk about um, Doctor and companion pairings. Uh, and that's one of the things is like, I, I'm more interested in Doctors and companions that weren't on screen together that would be interesting pairings. Well, what do you think? You know, of course, we you know, we just saw uh, as we record this, we just saw the, the the teaser for the upcoming special, the the, the final thirteenth Doctor special, and it, it's going to have Tegan and, and Ace. Mm -hmm. and Ace. And of course, I was, my reaction was was you know I was thrilled because those are those are two of my favorite companions, and I think they would be you know they will be awesome together if they write it the story correctly. But yeah, um, you know, and and. And so my response uh, on Discord when, when they posted this question was, well, definitely Tegan and Ace with the Seventh Doctor. You know, that somehow Tegan ends up running in with Seventh Doctor and Ace. And part of it is because Tegan wouldn't put up with the Seventh Doctor and his trying to be mysterious. She'd basically tell him off when he'd try to do that. Right, right. Even more than Ace <laughs> does. Um, and I, I, I think that will be a good path. As far as, like, the story, I don't know. I'm not that creative to come up with a with yeah. a, a story that would, would work well. So, but I, yeah, I, I, of course, I, of course I'm a fan of the seventh doctor always have been too. So. Yeah. How about you, Jimmy? So, um, I, so one thing I would be tempted to do, and this is breaking the constraints of the question a little bit, but one, one doctor who, so for a long time, one of the things I would have done would be essentially a version of the timeless child. I mean, I wouldn't have done it that way, but I would establish that the doctor had prior regenerations because they'd already hinted at that a bunch mm -hmm. of ways in the show. And I would have just made it canonical. And I think it expands the doctor's mysteriousness. If there's this whole chunk of his life, we don't know about. But one thing I have also said I would do if I was ever given the opportunity to write Dr. Who stories, whether for big finish or anywhere else is retcon the Aztecs so that I think her name is, Kamisha or something like that. It's the woman mm -hmm. the doctor accidentally gets engaged to. Mm, right. Um, that's River Song. She 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 looks <laughs> oh, like yeah. River. She looks a lot like River Song. She acts a lot or can read as if she's acting like River Song. I would I would establish that that's River Song. Yeah. Uh, so River Song is one of the companions that I would be tempted to use in a story. Also, the doctors I would be tempted to use would be two and seven. Patrick Troughton's and Sylvester McCoy's doctors are two of the most interesting to me from the classic era. I, and I think there's more that can be done with their characters. Um, companions that I would be interested in using with, with you know, would be uh, Jamie, 
mm-hmm. uh, from the second doctor and Ace from the seventh doctor. And I think it would be fun to put Jamie and Ace together mm-hmm. because on oh, the yeah. one hand, they're both action personalities. They, they, they aren't sit around and think or get captured and scream companions. They are, let's be active, but they're coming from very different mindsets. You know, um, Ace is an inner city kind of punk rock girl, and Jamie is from the 1700s and has very different attitudes about everything. <laughs> and so I think putting the two of them together could be a lot of fun. Um, mm. in, terms of the, in terms of this, what the story would be about, I don't know, but a villain I am always tempted to play with. Uh, you know, in terms of storytelling possibilities, is Missy, mm-hmm. mm. and I could, I you know, any just give her an excuse to do something that brings on chaos, and she'll do it, and that can be a <laughs> lot of fun. Um, one one thing I, I I just remembered that I wanted to mention too was I've always had the feeling that Stephen Moffat missed a chance for a pairing that wouldn't be the most exciting pairing, but would be something I think would be a great connection. And that's to bring Ian Chesterton back during the 11th yeah. or 12th Doctors. Yeah. Um, because we know that he's the, the and headmaster. Susan. It, well, yeah. And Susan. He's the headmaster yeah. of Coal Hill School, which Clara is working at. And he's still alive. As a matter of fact, he showed up. You know, uh, William Russell showed up in the, the, 50, the uh, Adventure of Space and Time. That, right. that docudrama about mm-hmm. the creating of Doctor Who. So I think that was a big miss. And... and uh, uh, Suzanne Ford is also alive, or I think yeah, well, she's still alive right now. Yeah. yeah, so both those would be good opportunities to go all the way back to the very beginning and connect right. it in with yeah. the eleventh or twelfth Doctors. I, I still think that was a missed opportunity, and I, I don't know how that would work going forward. Well, maybe, um, maybe, maybe Russell T Davies will do it. I mean, he brought back Sarah Jane Smith mm-hmm. in in that school reunion episode. He could do the old school reunion and get Susan and Ian Chesterton back in the same yeah. story. That would be awesome. I was going to say the only the only problem is that um, you know they're both those those actors are you know they're if they're not ninety they're approaching it very rapidly. So yeah, I was going to say Susan is Gallifrey and she could be a regeneration. So you may not have the same well, actress. I'd bring back the, the origi- I'd bring back the original actress. She might regenerate yeah. in the episode, but I bring back yeah. the original actress. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, that's what I, that's what I'd want to see as well. So for my pick, I like the uh, the the pairing of um, new and old. Uh, like so, the classic versus in, plus new. And so I was thinking, what I'd like to see is like Amy Pond in the Third Doctor or oh, Donna that Noble. Would, that would in be the, so difficult. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Or the or the Fourth Doctor in Donna Noble, like. How would that pairing go? <laughs> that that one could be, be fun. That, that could would be fun. fun. And I would l- love to see them, uh, the story, m- meeting uh, Sherlock Holmes. That would be... Now, I know Sherlock Holmes is a fictional character. I get that. But just mm-hmm. somehow... So you, you'd have Benedict Cumberbatch take up the role again? Oh. Yes! Yeah, that would be awesome. But mm. I, that's another thing Moffat missed was the opportunity to bring those together. He talked about being open to it. I mean, he yeah. acknowledged it would be kind of a prostitution Meta. of the media, <laughs> but he he said he was up for it. That now, there awesome. is actually a way to meet Sherlock Holmes other than just declaring him to be real in the uh, Doctor Who universe, which is they go to the land of fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, and they can meet Sherlock Holmes there. Now, the land of we haven't we haven't reviewed the land of fiction yet, but it's okay. coming up in a second Doctor serial called The Mind Robber, where they mm-hmm. do go to the land of fiction and do meet fictional characters. Interesting. Okay, okay, that would be fun. So, anyway, th- thank you, oh, Stephen. For, uh, uh, yes, I was also going to say. So, if you're into you know these cross new classic uh, junctures. You Big Finish has got you covered, yeah. Um, because they have like new doctors, old monsters, and old doctors, new monsters, and then recently they've been doing old doctors, new companions, and new companion or new doctors, old companions, mm. where they right. take you know like a doctor from the classic period and give them companions from the new period and vice versa. Right, and or you know, a, a classic doctor running into the weeping angels and that sort of thing. So yeah, yeah, interesting. All right, so again, thank you, Stephen, for the the fun question and the uh, the interesting speculation that we got to do on that. 
Uh, as we wrap up, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Doctor Who, including Grant S., Jan C., Brent B., Bob M., and Anthony V. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Doctor Who and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. And we'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits the show for us. So that's it from us. We want to hear what you think of the this 12th Doctor story. Listen, you can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com, the Secrets of Doctor Who Facebook page. Send an email to Who at sqpn.com or visit the StarQuest Discord community at sqpn.com slash discord. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the fifth Doctor story, Terminus. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Doctor Who. Thanks, Tom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Uh, Terminus, I feel ill. <laughs> Not for the reason you might think. <laughs> and once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Doctor Who on StarQuest. And remember, dad skills. <laughs>